Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining me today. My name is Lauren Evans and I am a user experience researcher at Workiva. And what that means is my job is to deeply understand our users and to assess how um, our designs are fitting those needs of the users. So I have a deep interest in discovery cycles because of my job. And that I think is a bigger part of what I like to call discovery operations. So um, TLDR is, are you talking to customers? Kind of like our keynote speaker was talking about, you need to be talking to customers. This is how to do it in a structured, scientific way. <coughs> and so discovery ops is that act of gathering data and making sure your design these four things. Discover, explore, test, and listen. So I'm one of those UX people that doesn't make things pretty. So this is the one graphic that I made. And just bear with me. But um, it kind of depends, one, where you're at in the product development life cycle, and um, how much you either know or you don't know. So who does these? Who does a discovery cycle? And typically, if you have the luxury of having a UX team, and I say it's a luxury because not everybody does, or um, you have product managers, typically it's a UX designer, if you're lucky enough to have a UX researcher, a product manager, and maybe an engineer or a front-end engineer that really cares about the user need. Um, and that's usually your discovery, triad, rhombus, whatever you want to call it. But I like to think that it's not just restricted or siloed to that group. I like to think it's everybody's responsibility. So if you're an engineer, you need to be making sure that you know what you're building, why you're building it, who you're building it for, because your input and everybody's input really kind of aggregates that up into a shared understanding that could be leveraged differently than, say, the four people that typically always do it. So another example is maybe you're a DevOps team. You don't have a typical customer but your customers are other engineers. You're still building product for people and you need to be making sure that you're hitting those needs. Um, maybe you're in marketing or you're in, you know, outside of R&D. You can still be doing discovery cycles and making sure what you're building is on the right track. So um, product development is a series of best guesses. And um, I like to ask, you know, have you ever had a time you've built something, you shipped something out, and it just got scrapped, or you had to rework it. Raise your hand, have you had that happen to you? How did that make you feel? <laughs> Mad, right? It's frustrating. <laughs> you put your blood, sweat, tears into this stuff. You care about this, you're motivated. Whether it's money, whether it's self-satisfaction that you're making something cool and better for people and putting the best technology to it. But this, and I'm gonna say it quite frankly, when you have to scrap it, you failed. You failed in some degree, right? So product development is a serious best guesses. Wouldn't it be great if we could um, reduce that risk of this happening? Get more informed and increase our confidence that what we're shipping is going to hit the mark. It's not gonna get scrapped and we're gonna be able to build and iterate upon it later. So that's what I believe a discovery cycle is gonna provide is you're gonna put a framework on how to collect feedback in a scientific way and um, reduce your risk, increase your confidence. So I like to think of this in terms of statistics. My background is in statistics. So um, we all know that there exists this idea if uh, we were to go and measure every human being in the world that we could get a true average population height. That exists out there in the world, that concept, right? And what would that involve? It would go you would have to go and measure every single human being in the world with the same protocol, with the same measuring stick and the same unit. And do you think that's possible? Do you think we could obtain that real number? No, we can't because there's gonna be some kind of error, this, that, whatever reason. And so we use statistics to estimate that, right? So we come up with some method, we can estimate the average, we can estimate the error. So what, within what error are we to this true average? And that's what I like to think of this in, in parallel to. So there is this idea out there that there's a best design. But bad news again, we're never going to achieve the best design. We're never going to achieve the best solution. 
we are striving towards it or trying to get towards that, but we're not going to get it. So let's take our discovery cycles and get us closer to that estimate, put some error bounds on it, and hope that we're getting close to that. Okay, so getting into the elements of a discovery cycle. So the first one being discover, and I go through it in this linear way, but again, it's not linear. So discover, and my little notes here. So this is where we define the who, the want, the, the need, and the real delight. So who, who are you building this for? So we, in the last talk I was noticing there's a lot of customer, listen to your customers, but does customer equal user? Does buyer equal user? So who here uses Slack for work? Raise your hand. Okay. Who here was um, involved in buying Slack or in the decision making process? Raise your hand. Okay. So a very small subset of people that raise their hand, right? So that's a good example. The people that raise their hand that were involved, they are users of Slack. They didn't buy it. So sometimes people who are your users are using your product and it's not in their control. So you need to know that distinction. Also, do you have different types of users? So, and you actually call these personas, but they're quite simply, they're groups of users doing the same things. They share some, some kind of demographics. And typically, the needs vary across these user groups. So understanding how those things vary, you need to know that because what you address for one group of users might be a pitfall for another group. So a recent example, and I'm probably saying this wrong because I don't stay up to date on recent events, but my husband shared this with me. So Uber, they put out this feature that you could book with um, drivers that had a certain average. So you could block lower rated drivers. So that's great as a consumer, as a writer, because you go, great, I'm going to have a great, a better experience. I'm not going to get stuck with these poor drivers. But what do you think that how that impacted the drivers, the ones with the lower scores? They're going to be unhappy users. And Maybe that was a conscious decision, but you need to be aware of those as you're making them. So users have problems, they have wants, they have needs, and to them, when you talk to them, they're gonna see, like they're gonna be like this turtle. They're gonna be like, I'm struggling, I'm struggling. But you, that's what we're trying to discover in this discover phase: is what are these things, okay? And if you don't know these things, you go to test, you figure it out, you choose a method to get that data. But once you have those, you want to structure a problem statement. So this is a very kind of like North Star thing that you write out. It could be a paragraph, it could be a sentence, whatever. But it's a shared thing that everybody knows, engineering team, UX, discovery tribe, whatever it is, what problem are we trying to solve? Who are we solving it for? How are they doing it today? Okay, so you just have that out there. It's your North Star. So some other things to keep in mind when you're coming into, problem, into these problems, you're going to have baggage, aka biases. So you're going to have hypotheses and assumptions. Document those. Know what those are and be able to distinguish what is actual data and what is an assumption and how do I make sure that I'm validating that assumption or I'm not. Okay? And that goes, identify the unknown. So if you start writing out these hypotheses and assumptions, you're going to go, hmm, we actually don't know that. We don't know that. Okay, these are unknowns. These are what we need to get answers to. Know your scope. So again, with the whole idea of the different groups of users, who are you targeting? Um, are you only targeting a little subsection of their workflow? Or are you trying to solve the entire thing? What is that scope? And is there any previous research you can leverage? So if you get good at doing discovery cycles, you should have a wealth of documentation which we'll talk about later, where you can go back and say, yep, we did kind of, we got some information here and here, and we can piece that together, and we're already on a um, faster path. So into the next phase of explore, so how are you gonna solve this? And this is likely everybody's favorite stage, right? We wanna rush through Discover, and we just wanna go stick, how are you gonna solve this? Let's solution, this is great. We like solutioning. And this is typically where your UX designer or your whoever is making um, the front end stuff or what have you goes off, comes back with this shiny prototype, says, here, this is what we're going to build. And you go, hmm, maybe as an engineer, you go, hmm, uh, okay, I guess that's what we should build. And this is where, again, this is everybody's responsibility. So um, I call this ideation, not anything new, but go and ideate 
on different solutions. And that can be solo, that can be one person, that can be as a group. So the best sessions I've ever been on is when we have a group of engineers mixed with UX people. And we, there's different techniques to do this, and I'm not going to go too deep into it, but look at those. And where you have the engineers showing out their ideas, and you have the UX people, and then you merge those. And you, engineers think very differently in terms of solutions than somebody else. It's just as many ideas as you can get, the better. Um, the other bit to be thinking about here is as you go through all these different ideas is be sharing them out internally, share them outside of your group, and try to get a variety of um, technical lift on these solutions. So get a really complex one that's going to be super hard to build to a really easy one, and get a variety of those there. You're going to need an artifact at some point. So determining, and this will help you when you get into the test phase, but what type of artifact you're going to need and what the, is that artifact going to provide you in terms of answers. So I say artifact, and typically these are things like prototypes, or maybe it is code that you build, you put into your app. Um, sometimes these are napkin sketches, but it's not always code, it's not always a prototype. Sometimes these are things, just spreadsheets that you're trying to describe a flow or are these the types of things that you're doing, yes or no? Just something that will communicate to whoever you're trying to communicate to for, so a user or it's an internal conversation, that is going to illustrate your concept. And sometimes this is for stakeholders too, where you're just saying, this is our vision, this is where we're wanting to go. So determine what kind of prototype or, excuse me, artifact you need and know if it's going to be a distraction later. So sometimes if you make something that is too high fidelity or you even build it in your app, people are going to get hung up on what it exactly looks like. And that's not the input you're trying to get. You're trying to get input over I don't know, something else, but they're going to get hung up on the data that's in there. And it's like, no, just ignore that. So be able to weigh out if I make something that's too high fidelity, too close to what the app looks like, that could be distracting. And the other side of it too, something that's too low fidelity, somebody can look at it and be like, this, this looks like a child's drawing. And sometimes that's the point of those, but they will get distracted by that. So test, are you on the right track? And this is my favorite one, I mean, as a researcher. Um, so we need to validate our ideas in a scientific way and get answers to what you don't know. And there's many different methods out there. So I could spend hours and hours talking about different research methods, but we're not going to do that. Google them, figure them out. They're out there, there's a ton of different resources for that. But you need to know, you need to pick a method. Sometimes it's not just one, maybe it's a combination. Like I said, you go through different rounds of these, so you might have a couple different methods on the same topic that help get you those answers. But pick a method and um, start testing your ideas. So get that user feedback. So um, you need to know who are you going to test with? Is this something that we're going to test with internal users, if you have that available to you? Are you going to test this with real users? How are you going to get those users? What's readily available to us? What different types of users? So back to that whole, who are your types of users? Do you need to get a smattering of those? Do you need to get some from one group? Get a good sample. Get a representative <laughs> sample. So I want to give a warning on this, though. So when you go and test, it's like, great. We have this idea, maybe there's some controversy around it, and we go, we'll validate it, we'll go test it, we'll get support for our ideas. But that's not why you're doing this. You're doing this to learn. And so sometimes you're going to get an answer that you're not going to like, and you need to accept that, and you need to detach from your ideas. And if you can't do that, have somebody else test your work. Have somebody that's objective, because it's really hard when you're the one designing it to pull yourself away and be objective about what people are saying because you've designed it, it's your, you're attached to it in some degree. So my coworker, Alex Islin, um, said this in a little bit different way, but I really like this quote. So this becomes a problem because we end up training ourselves to expect clear, unequivocal answers that resolve our uncertainty. And a little bit what I was saying is what he's highlighting here, but the other side of it too is you might go through this and test something and you might be feeling, yep, okay, we're getting, we're getting the data, we're starting to understand more, and you might hit this point where you're like, well, crap. Um, nothing is the way we thought it is. And we're even more uncertain than we once were. What we thought we knew, what we thought we assumed, that's all out the door. 
embrace that. Don't just go, well, shoot, I need to just, we need to just come up with a decision, or I think we know best. Like, no, embrace that, track it, go back through this again, and figure out how you're going to learn and get those answers. And maybe that's a part where it's hard because you might have to slow down engineering, or you might have to slow down what you're working on, and that's okay. And I'm gonna share some examples later of where it will save you. Go listen. This is the most important one. <clears throat> the most important one, okay? So how are things going? You're gonna launch your feature, you're gonna launch your product, and you're excited, you're like, yes, okay, we got it. Finally put this out there, and how's it going? Like, are you people liking it? Are they using it? Did we get the mark? And how are you gonna know, right? Like, how are you gonna know? So how many of you have launched something and not defined when it's successful? You just launch something and ship it and forget it. And it's fine. I'm not saying that's bad. Like, it's totally fine. But here's something to take away. True validation, so this whole testing bit, is when your design is launched in the wild and available for all your users. So the, all the testing you did is supposed to get closer to making sure that when you do do this, that you validate it right and it's going to be successful. But this is when, um, you know, rubber hits the road, rubber hits the pavement, whatever. You know, and you want to make sure your tires don't shred. So you need to be listening for that. So you need to define what success is. Okay, so how do you know something you launch is successful? And the way I like to think about this is start with what did you launch or what did you provide? How is it providing value to the user? And then put some kind of metric around that. Don't start with, oh, these are the things we should measure. Just start with what is the value? What is it providing? And are they doing that? So sometimes that means you're tracking adoption or people using it. Sometimes you're tracking satisfaction. Sometimes you're tracking um, did nothing change at all. Sometimes you put something out there that shouldn't affect the user, but it's a change to, I don't know, the back end, but there's no, but you hope the user doesn't notice it. So maybe that's what you're looking for. Beyond that, do you just have mechanisms in place for your users to reach you? So those could be in-app um, feedback mechanisms or surveys, or you're just doing customer calls. Maybe you have customer service type people. You can be getting feedback from them. Go find those avenues of feedback and be collecting that because even when you're not asking for feedback on something you launched six months ago, they're gonna be talking about it. They're gonna say, oh, I really wish you could just put this thing in there or whatever it may be, or maybe they really love it. You wanna hear all of it, right? So that's kind of the end of the um, components, but one big thing to keep in mind is document this stuff. Document this stuff. Because one, you'll want to come back to it later, and two, it serves as shared understanding. So I keep mine in this kind of template here that um, not all of these apply for everyone, but anytime we start a topic, I start with this document, we start filling it out. And if we can't fill out a section, say like our problem statement, well, we got a problem. We need to do something to figure that out. Okay, so what, that's all like the information part of it. And I wanna share some stories because people remember stories rather than they do information dumps. So here are some stories from the trenches. And Effie's not here, which is good. So this first story, if you know Effie. Um, this first story, um, we have, so the product I work on it has a database and we have some kind of mechanisms for users to view their data. We call it reports, okay, and their views of their data. And we were approached by another team to say, hey, we can put comments on these reports. And we go, great, that would probably be good. And we're in the process of trying to solve this problem we were hearing from our users um, <coughs> that they wanted to be able to um, gate people from making changes directly to the data um, but also not totally restrict them. Let them suggest changes and have an approval process around that. Okay, so we were like, well, we learned that customers are using comments today to do that in these other type areas of the app. So maybe we could do that for the same thing with comments on our reports. Cool, right? And so we said, well, we better test this to make sure that we already started getting rolling in the process. So there was development already going, right? And we go and test this and 
seems to be good. People are like, yay, cool, like, I, I like comments, whatever. But we found we were missing a really critical piece of this. Just for the comments, like, usability in general. We didn't have a way for you to find where the comment was linked to. So you can have a quick navigation to where um, the comment was. So if you imagine like a spreadsheet style looking thing and there's comments all over, which comment is tied to which piece of information. And that was critical for one, this whole gated changes story that we were trying to solve and two, just like comments in general. So we came back to the team and said, hey, um, we need this piece of it, can you do it? Can this be a part of it when we launch it? And they said, that's really technically heavy, no. So we said, okay, and this is where I just kind of left it off, and you guys make a decision, I give you the data, and they decided not to launch it. And I was like, yes, 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 we made this great decision not to launch something. And Effie, who is, I work with Effie, and he's a UX designer, he comes to me, he's like, Loren, we failed, we failed this. And I'm like, what do you mean we failed? He's like, we didn't launch it. I'm like. No, we, and granted, it's true. We failed in the sense that we spent time to develop something and went down this path of solution, it was expensive, but we didn't fail because we didn't launch something that would ultimately be not fitting the user need and could ultimately piss them off. Because you launched this thing, and why doesn't it have it here? I can't use it, but I want to use it, and you're like teasing me because you put this in the app. So that was a win. If he doesn't see it, I still think he holds on to that, but um, <laughs> it's okay. I'm still like, yes, it was a win. I love it. We made, we made a very data-informed decision that um, while it was expensive, because we did start going with it, um, we made the right decision, and it was great. So story number two, and I get to share all my stories. I didn't think I'd have time, but story number two is, let me remember, <laughs> same with the same team. So. Um, the whole bit about expecting clear and equivocal answers. So sometimes you're going to be showing like two different versions of a prototype and you're going to be like, okay, do they want, you, they want prototype A, they want prototype B. You do A-B testing because that's all the hotness right now. Like, yeah, let's A-B test. And I hate A-B testing. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Because um, it's like one of those things that's like, you're going to get an answer as to A is better than B or B is better than A. And it's not always like that. And so this example of this is, again, we had this, we have data and we have a, a way for you to look at all your data and one of the ways we display it is in this um, table style format and we were trying to make it more performance so we found a way um, that would change how it was displayed and it was like in a, in a list view but it took away some functionality in the prior version and we were unsure if users were going to be okay with that. We didn't have feedback mechanisms in place to know what they use on that so we couldn't tell oh, we know users use these functionalities over here, so let's talk to them. We didn't know, so we're like, well, we, we'll go talk to our users. So we talked to them, we showed them this new design, compared to what they had now, and said, you know, what would you prefer, that type of thing, and it wasn't just a clear answer of like, I prefer this one, or I prefer this one. So what we ended up doing was making a toggle so that they could choose. And then we come back and listen and say, okay, are they choosing one version or the other? Um, and is that clear? And we found that they're not. We went back and looked at it and we said, actually they're not, they're still using both. So they're using elements of both. So that might require an iteration, again, to completely solve that problem. Oh, and I missed a really important thing on the last story, which makes me really excited because it was recent. So back to that other story, um, the whole game changes, we never solved that, right? Like we just didn't, we didn't ship something and our customers really wanted it. We didn't solve it. Um, well, we came back and we did, we did. And we made the better solution for it. And guess what? It's so far, like from what I see, it's good. And it's hitting, like people are using it, doesn't mean, but we're still in the process of discovering if that is hitting the mark. But we came back and made a better solution for it. We actually launched something recently. And that was an example of where we went through that discovery cycle um, probably like three or four times, I would want to say. We didn't just do it once and one and done. Um, last example. So, our users use different types of products in conjunction with ours, and a lot of times they'll be asking for features of those other products to be in our environment. And sometimes there's a lot of features there, and we're like, maybe we should come up with a way for them to use their tool and better with our tool. So we came up with a way for them to do that, and it was 
going to be for a narrow subset of users. We're going to we targeted one piece of software that they use the most, and we said, well, we'll kind of let them work with that because we know that's what they use the most. And sorry, I have to be super vague because um, some of this stuff I cannot share. So I'm just talking in very vague, and it's intentional. But um, they we put this out there, and we kept hearing more of the same feedback that, that it was supposed to solve, and we're like, what the heck's going on? So we even talked to these people, we're like, hey, um, what are your pains? You know, what's going on here? And they would tell us, and we're like, well, do you know about this new thing that we put out that will help you, that will let you work, and that and it'll solve a lot of your issues? And we're like, no. We're like, huh, why don't you know about that? So we come to find out something that we launched they didn't even know about, um, because we didn't make it generally available for everybody, and um, it didn't solve it. And we're still trying to figure out, you know, do we just turn it on for everybody and let them come to us? Because it's something that we have to manually turn on in their account. And we kind of don't know what that is yet, but we still hear them. And the ones that are using it, they, they can't fully leverage it yet. So we didn't quite hit the mark there. So what I'm trying to illustrate with all three of these stories is that you're going through these discovery cycles and it's not just like you're building product, you move on to the next thing. You're building product, you move on to the next thing. You're building product and you're building off of it, but you're always coming back and you're always listening and improving it if you're truly being iterative. <coughs> so what I want you to take away from this, this is my last slide here. Let's make sure because I wrote a really nice thing. Okay, so um, I don't think that you need to start huge on this. I don't think like I'm, what I'm trying to say is like don't start like in just think you need to do full-blown discovery cycles if you're not doing them. Start with something small. Start with sitting in on a call with a user, and maybe that's with your customer service people. Maybe somebody in your company is already doing this kind of stuff. Just sit in and listen to it. Multitask, whatever you need to do. Just start absorbing this stuff. And um, you'll start to hear really small things. So I find this incredible. and. Um, like we'll have an engineer sit on a call and it's for a topic and we're not even thinking about something, but they'll see something like, oh, that's not right, that's a bug. They'll go in and fix the code. And it doesn't have to be a whole big thing, right? It's just, oh, I saw that's a bug and usually you have to go and take it in, blah, blah, blah. And maybe it gets touched, it gets put in your backlog and all that stuff. But in that moment, engineer's like, oh, I'm sitting on this call, oh, that's weird. Oh, this is just like something to fix really quick. And that's a win, right? And you don't have to do, and that's not even a whole discovery cycle. And, one of the points I missed was you don't do this for everything. You need to weigh the cost to benefit on this kind of stuff. Because you can over engineer this and say, we need discovery on everything. We need to do everything. Jade likes to call it analysis paralysis. Like we can sit here and talk and do um, interviews and like do this till we're blue in the place, but at some point it doesn't become fruitful. So you need to know um, is what you're building risky enough that you're willing to take an edu educated guess and just throw it out there. And sometimes, yeah, that's, yeah, you do that. But sometimes you don't. And sometimes you need to take a step back and say, this is really risky. This could really impact people. This could cause churn. That's like a big one. And we need to make sure we're making the right solutions. And that's when you need to go and do that discovery cycle. But it's for you to ultimately determine. Don't do it on everything, or maybe it is lightweight, but, um, just the main point is just start doing something, something big or small, to anchor what you're building around a user need. And I wasn't going off my notes because now I'm remembering all the points I want to make. So um, <laughs> I noticed um, when, like, especially in the last week, I, I really noticed it probably because I was writing this talk and it was like in my face was we like to make a lot of definitive statements when we're trying to talk about solutions for our users. So. Like things like, oh, well, the user does this, and so this is why we built this, and the user does this. And I was sitting on a product that I'm not as familiar with, so I was sitting there going, well, how do we know that? And I was, so I just started asking them, like, okay, they make that definitive statement, I go, how do you know that? And they would say, well, uh, I don't know, I just, that's what I think they do, and I go, huh, okay. And then slowly in this meeting, it's kind of comical there, thought I was like trying to, like, I don't know, be condescending or something, because I kept saying, like, well, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that? And I was like, no, that's not my point. It's like, I, I don't know how you know that, and what it boiled down to is they thought they had a bunch of assumptions, and their whole solution that they were going off of was based on assumptions, and that's fine. I'm not saying that's wrong. <coughs> it's just 
you need to be aware of that and you need to be aware of when I need to test that. So main point again, just do something small to anchor your product development around a user need. Okay, and that's all I have. So any questions?